All right, well then we'll get started. Um, my name is Jackie Borchard. I am um, the Director of Operations at Vision Ford Association located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I am the co-chair of the Data and Research Committee along with today's presenter, um, Dr. John Cruz. So it's my pleasure to be able to introduce um, Dr. John Cruz. Um, John has an extensive history working in the field of vision rehabilitation and most recently um, worked as a researcher at the Centers for Disease Control, CDC. And today he's here to present about the Big Data Project. Um, this is a project that's been undertaken by Vision Serve Alliance and The Ohio State University. And today John's gonna talk about the reports that have been completed so far and um, how to maximize the data that has been produced as part of those reports. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to John. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Um, you have to know, Jack and I have been working together for, um, I suspect, almost two years or so on this committee, and I, what, I, uh, what I argue is that Jackie is the responsible adult, and she keeps proving that. She wrote me a note and asked today and asked if, she need, if I needed any help, and then she asked if I had signed up for this, uh, had signed up to get the link for the, for the presentation, which I had not, so, um, so thanks to her, we've... Uh, at least overcome one potential barrier uh, today. So I wanna thank everybody who's taken the time out to participate in this discussion today. Um, I, uh, I have two aims today. Uh, the first is that I want you to kind of understand uh, what we're trying to do with the big data report and the content of, the, of, the, of those reports because they're, they're, they're similar. We've, we've, we've created quite a few, we've, uh, we've finished quite a few now, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want you to understand kind of the content and kind of how we got there. And then I want you to be comfortable uh, to understand kind of the science behind how we got to that. So I'm not trying to make you scientists in this at all. But uh, people are going to be asking questions when you present the data, and I want you to feel comfortable and confident when you're responding to those questions. So I'm going to be presenting a that just a ton of information today. And don't be intimidated by that because there's gonna be adequate opportunities to go back through this. So this is just kind of an overview opportunity just to see what we're trying to accomplish and, um, uh, and kind of the rationale behind that. And, uh, but over time, as you study these reports, you're going to be, be, become much more confident in presenting the data and uh, and defending it among people who, who might ask some questions. So um, so let's go to the, the next slide. So the first the first thing we want to talk about is um, the, uh, what the what the big big data project is about. We started talking about this over a year ago. The idea is to produce fifty state reports, a national report, report for DC and Puerto Rico. So fifty three reports. And these are standalone reports that estimate the prevalence of vision impairment, blindness, and low vision at the state and county level among people at age 65 years of age and over. So we have the data that allow us to do that. These data were not available a few years ago. So it's kind of new, new data. And, uh, and what we know is that there's a lot of vari variability in terms of prevalence, and we're going to get at some of those issues and talk about that. And that's the reason these state level reports are important. Second piece in this is that we want to produce these standalone reports that describe you know, the social, economic, health, and quality of life factors among people with and without blindness and low vision over the age of 65. Uh, so as we understand the disparities in that population. So if people with vision impairment are just like people without vision impairment, well, then it's just a vision impairment issue. But uh, it's not that simple. There are a lot of other things going on and as clinicians, we know that. Uh, it doesn't take long to figure that out. Uh, but in this report, we have some, some quantitative data to begin to validate what you know qualitatively. Next slide. So the question is, why are we doing this, uh, uh, doing the, uh, the big data project? Next slide. So Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. I really like that. 
Um, because if in fact we're trying to affect change, um, we have multiple levers that we can use. And uh, one lever is, is data and being able to present that data in a meaningful way that describes the constituency that we serve. And so, um, and it's not the only level. Uh, so there are, there are multiple levers that we have. One of them is, is big data. So this does not solve every problem, but it, it uh, helps with one. Next slide, please. So um, part of the role of, I, I think, of data, having been a service provider and having been an investigator uh, at CDC is that, uh, uh, there are multiple ways that we can advocate for our constituency, and one is that we we are very good at telling compelling stories. We are superb at doing that because we have wonderful stories to tell. Um, but there's there's more dimensions to that, and one of those has to do with the prevalence of blindness and low vision among people with uh, uh, with vision impairment. That's part of the story. And then the circumstances. How do we describe the circumstances of people with, with a vision impairment? That is part of our advocacy. And then we want to be able to do that in a way that uh, provides a rigorous, comprehensive re report that is consistent across the country. So each state has a similar approach using the same data set. And so these data can be used for a number of things. We can talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's, it's the evidence that begins to support coalition building uh, to influence policymakers. And so um, that's, that's, that's the role of, of the data. Our stories that we tell about the human experience embellish that. So it's part of this very broad thing. Next slide. Tim O'Reilly said, who has the data has the power. Uh, and so people who you know, um, who are running big organizations and who are trying to make decisions, they want data. And, uh, and so we have, uh, we're trying to supply that. So we have, we can make a case to do that. Next slide, please. Then go to the next slide. So here's, there are two aims for the, uh, no, there, there are eight aims for this project. Um, one is provide state level data on the prevalence um, we're estimating the population, the prevalence is one thing, estimating population is another. So we're estimating the prevalence of blindness, small vision, among people age 65 and older by state. And then in each of these reports, we will provide county level estimates of the, of the prevalence of blindness and low vision in each state. Uh, so Texas, for example, has like 245 counties. I've I'm learning a lot about this. One is some states have a lot of counties. Um, and so next slide. Then beyond that, we want to provide state level data on the characteristics of people with and without blindness and low vision across several factors. Those include health, general health, prevalence of chronic conditions. So the question is, are people with vision impairment different from people without vision impairment in terms of chronic conditions? Uh, we will examine health-related quality of life, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. There are some disability measures that we can, we can use and to characterize our population. And then we have access to data regarding income, poverty, and education. And those are drivers that I think are really important that begin to affect the choices that uh, uh, older people with vision impairment have. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so we started talking about this idea about a year ago, I think. Um, what I thought was, well, we could do a report uh, that may, might be six to eight pages long, and uh, that could address a number of the variables that we've already talked about. And that report has morphed uh, into now a 30 plus page report that we're doing for each state. So there's a lot of data in it. Um, and we have to be careful on how we market that, but I'm gonna tell you the, con the, uh, uh, the structure of these reports. So, so for each report, it's like a page and a half that's an executive summary. So it's really hard, for, you don't wanna to go to somebody who's a policymaker or legislator and say, 
I want you to read this 30 some page report and then you know a lot about the population. I'm not gonna do it. But somebody might read a page and a half report or you might be able to read it to them if they are not, not engaging this topic. So first, each report has a page and a half summary. The second part of the report has a national perspective uh, on aging and vision impairment and talks about the role of vision rehabilitation. It's a very global kind of discussion for about, about three and a half pages, but we want to give that kind of contextual background to every reader of the report. Uh, so we did, we, uh, it, so it's, it's, it's general as you would expect. Then following that, we have, uh, we estimate the state level prevalence of vision, uh, of vision impairment among people 65 years of age and over. And we're gonna break that down by race, ethnicity, sex, and age group. So you'll see that. And then following that is a state map for each report that shows the prevalence of vision impairment by county. And it varies considerably. And you'll see that in a second. So we wanna show that variability. So you know what happens in this. You know, you, if you're using national data, uh, people say, you know, they say, well, here, this is a prevalence vision impairment based on this case data. They say, well, our state's different. Uh, and that's true. So, uh, so that's the reason we want, to, we want to do a state level report. But if you're working within the state, uh, people will say, well, you know, the, I, 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 I was in Michigan for uh, 15 years. And the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is very different from Detroit. Uh, and so there are major regional variations within states. And so just knowing something about the state does not tell you anything about the regional variation within the state. So we wanna get at that uh, uh, and kind of honor those that experience, that complexity of this. And then in addition to that, because of the data set that we have, we're able to look at chronic conditions, uh, health rate of quality of life and disability measures. We'll talk about that. that. That occupies five pages of this report. And then following this narrative with these fairly accessible bar charts in the report, then there's fairly intense uh, tables that shows uh, state and county level prevalence vision impairment. And you've got 60 variables in that. We're, com we're combining people, we're comparing people with and without vision impairment, and we're showing the state level data compared to national data. So uh, again, it's pretty dense, but it's the kind of stuff that you can pull from to make a case. So uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of that as we progress. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so you have to know this. The data that we examine uh, this is, there will be a test. <laughs> uh, the data we're, be, we're, we're examining is the it's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, BRFSS. It comes trippingly off the tongue once you've done this. I've been working with this data set for 25 years now. Um, the BRFSS is administered in every state. It's the same protocol, same sampling, for, same pro protocol that's in, involved in sampling uh, the population. Each state gets financial support and a structured protocol from CDC, so it's all done alike. Uh, and every state does this. And, and the states do these, these surveys, but CDC funds them. Now the states can uh, add questions uh, to, the, to the BRFSS. They have a lot of flexibility in doing that. And there's a, it's a, it, it, it is, I think I mentioned in here, it is the world's largest, I think I do the next slide, sample so 440,000 people annually. So it's the world's largest and oldest telephone survey. Now, just so you know, uh, the sampling frame is called a complex sampling frame, which means that you're not just sampling 440,000 people on the street. You're targeting who gets surveyed so that you're oversampling racial ethnic minorities, you're oversampling older people, so that you get a sense of, uh, um, of the characteristics at the population level. So it's, a, it's, it's not, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say it's overly complex, but it's not a simple thing, which means, however, that if you're using a complex sampling frame, you've got to do a post survey weighting in order to do uh, estimates. So there's a, there's a science behind this. Uh, and people do this all the time. They do 
good for a living, they're very competent in doing. Um, and, and so and people are going to ask questions, I think, about you know, the, the, the quality of the survey. Um, every survey has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, most of the questions that you and I are going to, to raise in terms of, of concerns about the survey are questions that the people in the BRFSS have already, uh, have already uh, thought about and have responded to. So it's, uh, it's a good survey. Now, the, the utility of the survey, uh, it has utility for us, but obviously if you're doing this big survey, it has utility for others. But the aim of the BRFSS is to look at the health behaviors and health risks. So health behaviors are things like smoking rates. So, you know, you look at BRFSS data, you look at CDC data, and you can look at variability of smoking by state, and you can look at it in a, in a longitudinal way, in a trend, I should say, uh, so that you can show that the smoking rates have declined uh, in, in various states and that there are still groups of people who are still likely to smoke. And so that knowledge helps you inform health policy and health interventions. So that's the aim of that of that of, of the survey. So in addition, uh, the survey allows you to provide state level up, uh, estimates if the population if the sampling size is high enough, you can do regional um, estimates, and most states do that, and, or you can aggregate the data and do a national report, as we have done. That's the one survey. The second survey that we uh, uh, are using in this is called the American Community Survey. And the American Community Survey is, is part of the census. It's administered by the census, and it's an ongoing survey. It's not just one that's conducted every 10 years. But you can aggregate data over a five-year period and you begin to make county level estimates. And that's what we're going to rely on for the count for our estimates of, of county level data. So we got two surveys, both of whom asked the, the, uh, the same question. Let's do go to the next slide. And then I'll move, try to move along a little faster, I realize. Okay, so uh, in each of these surveys, uh, this is the strength and weakness. I mean, this is what people do for a living. The case definition of blindness and low vision in this survey is a positive response to the question, are you blind or do you have serious difficulty seeing even when wearing glasses? So the respondent, so that's, there's a, that, that question appears in the survey, both the BRFSS survey and the American Community Survey. They ask the same, this, the same question. One of the weaknesses, nobody likes this question, uh, frankly, um, the, the good thing about the survey, that question is that it appears in the core of the BRFSS and has, I think, since 2013 or 2016. Um, and uh, it appears in the, in, the BR, in, the, in the ACS. So we have two, two major population-based surveys asking the same question. One of the problems with the survey is, is yes, no response. And so um, it's not a scaled response. A scaled response would be, would be would be better. Neither of those surveys, the BRFSS or the ACS, ask about vision rehabilitation. So we we don't know if people that we're describing have had vision rehabilitation or have not had vision rehabilitation. You can't bet that they have not because so few people do. But um, so it's a, it's a limitation of the survey. I think for our purposes, it's a pretty good question, frankly, because it's getting at severity of vision impairment. And uh, so when you look at the prevalence rate, um, we, we can talk a bit about that. Next slide, please. All right, so at this point, we have completed nine reports have been released. Uh, one national report and state, uh, uh, eight state reports. 15 reports are being uh, completed and there's plans to continue to do this. So we get 50 states. So what I wanna talk about today is the responses that we have to the nine reports. And I want you to see the variability within that. So, so you can see the states, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Missouri, New York, California, Louisiana, Florida, and Oklahoma. A lot of very, a lot of, you know, those are very different states in terms of their regional uh, economic um, variability. So we're gonna, we're going to see some variation in there, which I think uh, you, you can engage. Next slide. So overall, uh, the national prevalence of blindness and low vision using our case definition, are you blind or do you have serious difficulty seeing even wearing glasses, is 7.3% among people age 65 years and age, age and over 7.3%. Now, is that an undercount or is it an overcount? 
it's an accurate count for that question. If you ask another question, you can ask a question like, uh, uh, do you have difficulty reading it, for example? Do you have difficulty seeing it? That will double the response rate. So, the, so is, this a, is this an accurate estimate? Is an accurate estimate of the question that is asked. So when, when you're when you're presenting these data and say oh, it's a low, this, the, the, you're lowballing the day the, the experience. No, we're not. We're reporting the 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 responses to this question. Is it a weak question? Yeah. Does it uh, does the nature of the question undercount the population? Probably. Um, but um, it's a limitation. So we have to go with what we got. Next slide. All right, so we already know this uh, without any having additional report, but we know that women are more likely than men to report blindness and low vision. We already know that, uh, but we validate that in this report. Moreover, uh, it's important to recognize that there are just more women uh, who are over the age of 65. So while the prevalence is higher, the population is going to be higher, yes, going to be substantially higher. Uh, of women, just because women have greater longevity. So you have two factors that are pushing that population. One is higher prevalence among women and the other is greater longevity. So just the absolute population of people with vision impairment is gonna be, is going to be higher among women. We also know that, um, that the older people get, the more likely they are to report vision impairment. So using our case definition, People 65 to 74, about 3.3% report vision impairment. 75 to 79, 7.4%. And age 80 and over is almost 10%. So we expect that kind of, of, of uh, distribution. And, um, uh, and so that, and that's reflected in the caseload. When you look at the, the people who come in the door, it's uh, typically it's going to be you know, people who are older uh, in uh, uh, older populations because uh, you know, prevalent age changes. Next slide. We also know um, from our experience that uh, that that vision impairment and blindness and low vision vary by race ethnicity. Um, and this uh, this survey validates that knowledge as well. So women, men, uh, whites are less likely to have vision impairment. So among whites, is six point one percent. Asians, 8.8%, Blacks, 10.5%, Hispanics, 13.9%, and Native Americans, 14.2%. Now, the nice thing about this, by the way, is that because we have a very large sample size for the na nation, um, we have a lot of confidence in, the, in these estimates. So uh, what typically, you know, typically we look at whites, Blacks, uh, Hispanics have, have may not have a large enough survey. Native Americans um, often have a very, very tiny sample, um, but this gives us a real sense of that. But look at this, you know, so um, uh, Hispanics and Native Americans, Hispanics are twice as likely as whites to have vision impairment. Native Americans are, you know, two and a half times more likely to have vision impairment. So, so there are groups that are more at risk of vision impairment than uh, than others, so you can begin to see this. You know, so it's going to be older people, women, racial, ethnic minorities. Next slide. Okay. So one of the one of the things I think it's important to, to ask uh, is uh, is is the is the prevalence is the population of people with uh, uh, with vision impairment evenly distributed across the the US and the answer is no, no, it is not. So as I already mentioned that, um, that the US average is 7.3% among old people of uh, 65 and older. The lowest is 5.8%. Uh, so uh, so that's the range, 5.8% too. Now, so what do you think, I'm gonna give you the answer. So uh, what do you think the highest would be if the average is 7.3%, the range would be from 5.8%, about a percent and a half below the, the, the mean, national mean, and to something else. So let's next slide, I'll reveal this. So of the nine states that we have looked at, Louisiana has the highest of, the, of these nine states, 12.4%. 
So here's this range. Look at this. This is a national data. The uh, people, older people living in Louisiana are twice as likely to report vision impairment as people in Illinois. Illinois has the lowest. Um, and I started start thinking about how that begins to drive things. Uh, so you have a higher prevalence of vision impairment in Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana is a poor state. Louisiana has uh, a high, po high population of, of, uh, of African Americans. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of drivers that are going to put people in Louisiana more at risk than people in Illinois, which does not mean that Illinois does not deserve services. It just means that it's going to be different in that state. So we have to, we have to begin to embrace that and tell that story. Next slide. So this slide then just shows the prevalence of vision impairment by the nine states and national data that we have. So it's got eight states and, and US data. So, uh, so nationally, about 7.3% of older people report vision impairment. In California, it's 8.3%. Remember, keep this at number in mind. 7.3% is the average. California is 8.3%, four to 7.5%. Illinois, 5.8%. Louisiana, 12.4%. Missouri 7.6, New York 7.1, Oklahoma 10.1, Pennsylvania 6. So now in each of these states, uh, if you live in that state, you can probably begin to infer why that population is higher. It takes that kind of local knowledge to begin to look at this. So this is the, so the point is, there's a lot of variability just in the prevalence. And so, uh, so and Illinois is a, so, uh, Illinois is a, a wealthy state, um, but still 5.8% of the entire older 65 population, so this is a pretty big population. Next slide. By the way, if there's questions, I think you can type in questions and I'm happy to respond to those. So that next issue, I think, then it has to do with um, uh, with the prevalence of vision impairment by county, and so we so we know the vision impairment. So next slide, please. Um, so so I just want to show you one state. I lived in Missouri for a number of years. I taught at my first incarnation. I I taught college English uh, in Springfield, Missouri, at Southwest Missouri State University. Met my wife there. Beautiful part of the country. Stunning part of the country. It's beautiful. And um, so in, in Missouri, the overall prevalence of vision impairment is 7.6%, so about, about the national average. But if you look at the county level estimates, that varies a lot. Uh, so as the county, Osage County, that's kind of up in the middle near Jefferson City, near the, near the state capital. Uh, so the, so the, the prevalence in that county is 22.6%. So then the question is, what is the low? That is the highest prevalence? And the next slide, I'll show you. It's twenty-one. Pem Pemiscot County is twenty. So look at this. I mean, this is huge variation, and this is a lot of variation. Not most states don't have quite this much variation. But so in Osage County, uh, the 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 prevalence of vision impairment among older people is really low. In uh, Pemscott County, which is in the lower part, it's in the boot heel of, uh, of uh, Missouri, down by the, uh, the Mississippi River, uh, is 21 points. So one person in five, older person in five, has vision impairment. So we, know, uh, so we create a state map. Next, next slide, please. So I, what we've done for the report is to create a state map. And, uh, and again, once you are in that state, you can see the state level variability and begin to understand that. So uh, having lived in Missouri, the lower part, lower part of Missouri is called the, the Irish wilderness. And uh, it is beautiful, uh, but there's nobody there. It's very sparsely populated. And, uh, and, and, the, and, and it's poor, poorer. And so the prevalence rates tend to be higher in rural counties uh, than in, in, in uh, um, in, in more urban counties. So as a resident, you can begin to can understand the dynamic and you can explain that in ways that I can't, but we can look at the pattern. So next, 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 uh, next slide. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, doing pretty good. All right. 
Um, so the thing, the thing that I, I think is important for us to understand is uh, it's just not prevalence. I mean, prevalence is, is part of the story. But it's the circumstances and it's the differences among it's the disparities among people with and without vision impairment that becomes the powerful message that we want to tell. So let's go to the next slide. So there, so in this the, each of these reports, we want to look at disparities. So we want to compare people with and without vision impairment across a number of variables. And then that begins to tell a story. And it begins to define a gap. And that gap or that disadvantage is where vision rehabilitation, I think, begins and the policies associated with that, that begin to define our role. So let's look at some of the data from that. I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through a number of things. Next slide, please. Um, go go through a number of variables. And, uh, and, and what, what, what I, what I, tell people when I'm presenting these, these data is, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I've been in this field for a few years. You already know this. Um, it's just, I'm giving you some numbers behind it. And so I'm val I think I'm validating what you already know. So we know that people with vision impairment are more likely to have a stroke. I mean, that makes sense. You have the stroke, uh, depending on where it occurs in relation to the optic mechanism, uh, it'll affect the vision impairment. So, so nationally, 17% of people with vision impairment uh, report stroke compared to 7.3% of people without vision impairment. Now, interestingly, in this, in this, I, I just looked in this, uh, we, we, in each of these reports, we look at like uh, 10 or 12 chronic conditions. I'm gonna report five, uh, five of them in, in the narrative of the report. Uh, otherwise, it's just, it, it's, the information is overwhelming. But, uh, people with vision impairment are more likely to have heart attack. I don't know. That's not. A, I don't see that as a causal pathway. There may be. There may be. But the fact of the matter is, if you're doing vision rehabilitation and you've got a client who has had a heart attack, you're probably going to treat that person a little differently than you are without. So it means it means as a professional, you have to bring that knowledge to serving your constituency. So it's important to know. They, that, that, they, that they've had a heart attack. As you would expect, diabetes is higher, 36% compared to 22% of people without vision impairment. So a third, third of the people having uh, uh, older people with vision, with vision impairment have diabetes. And then, and so, and that makes sense. So you have diabetes involved in diabetic retinopathy, vision loss, so that, that pathway makes sense. Then people with vision impairment, about 20, not 27 percent people with vision impairment report uh, depression compared to 14 percent nationally. A lot of variation state to state. Um, but to, uh, people with vision impairment are twice as likely. And so if you had, I can, we can assume that these, you know, very few of these people have vision rehabilitation services. So probably they have been visual. And so, um, so it makes sense that uh, if, uh, if, if you're older, you lose vision, you have you know, the consequent loss of support systems and autonomy and all that, that people become depressed. Uh, probably vision, vision rehabilitation probably eases depression. Uh, and, uh, but uh, nevertheless, people with vision impairment are more likely to report vision, uh, hearing, uh, report depression. Moreover, there is a question in the BRFSS that asks, uh, it's similar to the vision question. It's, do you have serious difficulty hearing? And, uh, and I think it asks without hearing aids. So a third of older people with vision impairment, re I apologize for the dog in the background. A third of the people who, older people who report vision impairment also report hearing impairment. More men than women, uh, twice as uh, people with uh, vision, uh, old people with vision impairment are twice as likely to report hearing impairment. It's going to be more women, uh, more men than than women. Um, but think about the clinical uh, the clinical implications of that. You know, so if you're providing services uh, uh, to people who have a hearing impairment, uh, then you're you 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 have to address both the hearing impairment and and the vision impairment. 
And I would suspect, this is really, this is my little personal story. I have new hearing aids. They're $6,000, um, but they're great. They're much better than my old hearing aids. Um, but so there's cost associated with that. And so if you have to pony up $6,000 and people are poor, they're probably not going to get the hearing aid. And uh, so you have to you have to address that. So uh, multiple limitations, and you can begin to stop it. you can begin to to fill that in real quick. So let's go to the next slide. And what I want to do in this in 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 this slide is just look at the variability of stroke among people with without vision impairment compared so uh, you know so comparing people with vision impairment with people with not vision impairment age sixty five middle. And this pattern is striking, and I have not figured it out, frankly. Uh, across the eight states that we have examined, the prevalence of stroke ranges six, seven, eight, nine percent. It, it's most most of the states is seven, seven or eight percent among people without vision impairment. Among people with, with vision impairment, it ranges from ten percent to twenty one percent. And so what I don't know is why there's so much variability in the prevalence of stroke at the state level when it, among people without vision impairment, there's not. But the point is um, that it's important if you live in if you live in Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, or Missouri, uh, states that have very, very high prevalence of stroke among people with vision impairment, you want to know that. You want to be able to tell that story because those people have needs that you want to address in, in the vision rehabilitation program, and you want policies to follow that. So, so it's just amazing to me to see that kind of variability in the state level. Okay, next slide. And, I, and I, 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 what I want to do here is just show um, the prevalence of diabetes among people with without vision impairment at the, among the, the states. And again, a fair amount of variability. So kind of runs about 20, 22, 23% of people without vision impairment, but as high as 44%, twice as likely uh, in states like Louisiana. New York, now this is interesting. So think about this, California. So Louisiana is a poor state, we know that. And uh, so 44% of people with vision impairment report having stroke, very high. But California, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania, which are wealthy states, also have very high prevalence of stroke among people with vision impairment. Uh, something to think about, something that it's, it, we need to get the knowledge to understand why that pattern emerges. But also, we have to understand that in terms of, of tailoring services to people who have stroke and vision rehabilitation. Next slide. Okay, and now this just shows the depression, the premise of depression uh, at the state level. Again, I just want you to see the variability. It, it, among people without vision impairment, Pennsylvania is the lowest at 8%. Uh, Louisiana is the highest at 16% among people without vision, without vision impairment. But it ranges from 20% uh, to 32% among people uh, in, in, in Missouri. So in Illinois, 20% of people, older people with vision impairment report depression. A third of people in Missouri, a third of almost a third of people in Louisiana report depression. Uh, and, you know, again, you, you, we can tell the story. We can figure that out. Next slide. And so now this is, again, I, I say it's interesting. I think I, I I, I mean, you started thinking about this in, in context of your own state and then about what's going on. So this just this just shows the variability of, of hearing impairment from state to state. And a cons there's considerable variability. And uh, so um, generally, people with vision impairment are twice as likely to report he uh, hearing impairment, which we already showed that at the national level. But in Louisiana, 44% of older people with vision impairment report hearing impairment. Uh, it's also high in New York, 38%, high in Oklahoma, high in Missouri. Uh, we shared these data with some folks in Louisiana and somebody there mentioned that, um, yes, slides are available. Uh, 
the uh, and, and the person one, one person Louisiana mentioned that it was the high prevalence of uh, Usher syndrome among the Cajun population, and so that begins to make sense. So what I what I liked about that was that. You know, I can I can run these data and I can present these data, uh, knowing your state. You can interpret this in a way that I can't. And so, understanding those those contextual issues allows you to to understand this, and this backs up what you probably are, are already thinking. Next slide. I know we're running through a lot of the material here. Okay, so so in this paper, in the in this report, we're looking at chronic conditions, which we've been focusing on. And showing the dis there's a disparity, two, two things going on. There's a disparity between people with and without vision impairment among these chronic conditions. So all the chronic conditions we look at, people with vision impairment are more likely to, to report them. Uh, but there's also variability state to state. So it's not one, if we can figure all this out to do the best vision rehabilitation that we can, it's still going to be different in each state as we tailor those services for the, each particular constituency that we're dealing with. Now, I just want to jump into two other areas that we examine um, in this paper. That, and one is the disparities in health related quality of life. I'm gonna talk about that. And then we're going to look at some disability measures. Now, it's important to understand that um, when we're doing this analysis with Ohio State, that, uh, th that all of this work is original research. It's not available anywhere else. We did not cobble together existing research. We were, able, we were able to look at the BRFSS data and to then drill down for each state. No one has done that before. And, um, and then we looked at disability measures and no one has done that before. Now I've, I've published on Health related quality of life, and you can pull up those articles if if you if you like. But this gives us state level data uh, as well. So let's but let's just talk about what the national pattern that we have here. Next slide. So there's four questions in the the uh, in the BRFSS that deal with this concept of health related quality of life, and um, and so one question asks about just self reported health, and so it's a pretty standard question. We're all very good at this. Don't. Don't underestimate the value of the question. So you just ask people, we all do it every day. You know, how do you feel? And if you're honest, you say, well, you know, uh, I feel pretty. Can you hear me now? Um, so, so we're pretty good responses, uh, responses to that. So what, what we wanted to look, what I wanted to look at here was self-reported, fair, poor health among people with without vision impairment. What you see is people with, with vision impairment are twice as likely to report fair, poor health. So we think about all of this, look at these patterns of chronic conditions we've already looked at. And so we're not surprised when there's a high prevalence of fair, poor health. And then there's three questions, and I don't, I, I won't go into great detail, with, with this, but uh, and you can do that more at your own leisure. But there are three questions that ask out of the, called health related quality of life. It's a, it's a module, four question module in the BRFSS. And it asks in the last 30 days, how many days has your health been not so good? That's, that's roughly how the question is asked. And so, uh, so you, the responses can be zero, I haven't had any physical problems at all, to 30. Um, and so the percent that's shown here is the percent of people who report 14 or more days of physical distress. And so you can see it's about twice as high among people with vision impairments as people without vision impairment. There's a similar question then that says, how many days out of the last 30, uh, thank you, um, has your mental health, uh, have you had difficulty with your mental health? And so we've already seen the, that from our other er, already that um, people are more likely to have depression. And so this just validates that question. And then there's a question just asked how, how many days out of the last 30 was your activities, your daily kind of daily activities limited? And as you would expect, there's a, there's a difference in that. Let's go to the next, next slide. I, I know I'm rushing through this, but um, 
I just, just want to give you an overview. Now, there's some disability measures, and, and next slide. And uh, I'll show, uh, and, and again, nobody's looked at this before. So the disability measures are trying to get these, again, nobody's happy with these questions. So there, there's just limitations to them, but we have them both in VRFSS and the ACS. And for those of you who've been around for a long time, you know, we've really had difficulty measuring disability status. So this is an effort to do that. So there's questions about cognition, concentrating, remembering, mobility, walking, climbing steps, dressing, bathing, and then running errands. So running errands is like an IADL. Uh, so these terms are kind of, those old terms are passe, which is kind of a new measure. But the point is that people with vision impairment are more likely to report difficulty with cognition. Um, they're more likely to report difficulty climbing steps twice as likely, almost five times as likely, four times as likely to report difficulty bathing and, 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 and dressing, and about five times as likely to report difficulty running errands. Now, I think, nobody's looked at this before. So, and that's, and we've got now this is the state level. I think this is a, a, a very powerful argument about what vision rehabilitation does. If people, if people are, are report, people with vision impairment are reporting difficulty walking, climbing steps, it could be, I'm not asserting that, but it, it's likely that they haven't had mobility skills. So if they've been, had mobility training, you could push that down. Um, dressing, bathing, uh, kind of those uh, eight, those ADLs. That's that's what one of the things the vision rehab does. You think about running errands. You know that if you're running an errand, it means you've got to, you know, leave your home, get to where you want to go, find what you want, pay for what you want, and and, and all of those those topics are things that we deal with in vision rehabilitation. So I think these are pretty cool. A gap. Now let's go to the next slide, and then we're getting real close to the end here, and then we can do some questions and answers. Now, um, one question I wanted to ask was: uh, Is cost an issue of getting getting access to care? And uh, and and again, you see that uh, there's wide variability. Louisiana, for example, is like four times people four times more likely or difficulty. Uh, getting access to this, this is healthcare, uh, but it means they're probably getting access, they have difficulty getting access to eye care uh, as well. So there's a variability there. And next slide. Now, I think one of the things that I have learned in this work that I never really thought about and probably should have is the extreme that. Um, Older people with vision experience, and so uh, so chart. There's a lot of background noise. Just if somebody's uh, doing dishes, maybe mute. Um, but what you see is that uh, people with vision impairment are almost twice as likely to report incomes of less than twenty thousand dollars a year. Now think about this. So in Louisiana, poor state, we know. 20% uh, of, of older people without vision impairment report uh, incomes of less than $20,000. But 53% of older people with vision impairment in Louisiana report incomes of $20,000. Um, I mean, you can't do anything if, that, if that's your income. But look at New York. New York is a wealthy state, and it's a, it's a high cost of living state for much of it. Uh, and 50%, 48% of people in New York with vision impairment report incomes of less than 20,000. So, so my point in this, I think the discovery in this is I did not realize how great an issue poverty was. And if we dig down a little bit more further, we'll see that that poor education is also a factor and it drives a lot of this. So let, let's go on to the next, and we'll jump through and we'll get a little bit of time. So, uh, so here's the contribution of this report. One is all original. Nobody's, nobody's done this report, this work before. It's state-specific data. It looks at both the BRFSS and, and, uh, and the ACS. It's the only study that examines all these variables that we've talked about. Health, chronic conditions, health, period, quality of life, disability measures, and we have that at the state level. Um, it's the only study that has been published 
that provides county level estimates of blindness and low vision among older people. Um, and the data are recent, it's 2019. And the, the, the other nice thing about this report, it's the only place, now all this content is new, but it's all resides in one document. And so um, you can pick and choose from this one document, the information that you need to make the kind of advocacy that you want to. Next slide. Okay, so what, what we know, I think, uh, is that, um, that the constituency that we serve, the older people with vision impairment, are disadvantaged in multiple ways. And, they, and they're kind of compounding when you think about it. And that knowledge, I think, gives us a lever for the advocacy that we want to accomplish. So next slide. All right, so uh, I just like this little quote. You know, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And so this, and then next slide. And then uh, uh, Stephen Few said, uh, numbers have an important story to tell, uh, but they rely on you, meaning us, to give them a clear and convincing voice. So what I think is important is that with these data, we, we tell part of the story. It's only part of the story. Uh, each of us, as we're trying to advocate for our constituency, we can, uh, we can fill in that gap. Next slide. Okay, well, th thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I, I realize we're, we, we just have a few minutes, but I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have. We will be doing a companion webinar. It's going to be talking about strategies to, to use these data. But I think the first step is to understand um, you know, what we've got in, the, in these data sets and then how we arrived at this. And then from that, we can begin to suggest how we, how we uh, implement the, this information to, uh, um, to advocate. So happy, I'm happy to entertain any questions at all. Let's see. And you may have to unmute yourself if you are interested in, in asking a question. Yeah, so we've done, just so you know, we have done, uh, we've done, I, I can't remember, um, you know, not being asked a question I can't answer, I should be able to do that. Um, we have done, we've done the eight states, they're published. We've done the national report, it's published. That national report will be refined as we do a, additional states. There are 14 more that we have just completed. Libby can tell you, I think, what those states are. And then mm -hmm. we've got uh, seven more that we're beginning to work on. So we're about halfway through the, the 50 states. Libby, do you, do you have the states in front of you that? I, I do have the states. And if you will, uh, if you wanna know the states that have already been done, go to visionservealliance.org and click on the AVLNC tab uh, to reach those reports. And this uh, reports that we are finishing up are, are, and are in production now include 15 states. And that would be Arkansas, Colorado, Georgia, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Jersey, North Carolina, Oregon, South Carolina, Tennessee, Wisconsin, and Texas. And uh, if your state has not been named and you're interested, please contact me. My email address is on the current slide. All the attendees and all registrants will receive a recording of this webinar as well. Uh, as it will be posted on, um, on our YouTube channel. So please contact me uh, if you have any questions, would like to discuss participating in this program. Okay, any other questions? Um, if not, I, I just wanna thank you for you know, tuning in today and, uh, and participating in this. I, I think, you know, it's, I don't want to say this is too much information. This is a lot of information. 
I think what's going to happen is that as you become more familiar with it and you begin to advocate for particular topics, you're going to pull information from the report. Um, and I think you'll end up tailoring the findings here for different constituent groups. And we can talk about that. Um, but from, from my point of view, it has been extraordinarily gratifying to do this kind of work. Uh, I would have given anything when I was running a program, my program in Michigan years ago to have state level data like this. We, we struggled to tell our story and uh, we had very little evidence to do so. And so this gives us a kind of a leg up in that process. So thank you very much for participating today. And if you have, if you have remaining question, you know, just drop me a, 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 uh, an email. I got my email address there and I'll be happy to respond to that. Thanks a whole bunch. Appreciate it. Thank you.